It's a pleasure to have you with us. Welcome to the show. This week we speak to Ghanaian entrepreneur and educationist Fred Swanica. Now, he is creating a legacy in education that could totally transform the African continent. He shares his journey and his views on Africa as well. You get to have your say and also Africa's top 10. You're watching the Africa Leadership Dialogues. I'm Julie Gishuru. Based in Johannesburg, South Africa, Ghanaian Fred Swanica is the founder and CEO of the Africa Leadership Academy. This is a world-class pan-African secondary school that aims to develop future generations of African leaders. Recently, he founded the Global Leadership Adventures, a leadership development program for youth in 10 African countries. Before his foray into education, Swanika was a consultant at McKinsey & Company, providing strategic advice to the management teams of large companies in various African countries. He shares his insights on Africa and his journey into uncharted territory with nothing but his passion for education and for Africa. Fred, thank you so much for making time to be with us on the Africa Leadership Dialogues. Your story is fascinating. Um, the Africa Leadership Academy and your vision for this institution when did it start? And tell us about the journey. Certainly. It started about 10 years ago um, when I reflected on all the different experiences I'd had of living and working across the continent of Africa. So I'm originally from Ghana, but I left Ghana at the age of four. And uh, every four years of my life, I moved to a different country in Africa. And everywhere I went, I realized that we have tremendous potential on this continent. It's a beautiful continent. We have. Um, a lot of people with great ideas and a lot of resources. But, so there was no reason, I couldn't understand why we were poor. And the more I studied the situation, the more I realized that our leaders were not good. And uh, that unless we solved the issue of leadership, if we, unless we created better leaders for Africa, there was no way we could actually become uh, a peaceful and successful and prosperous continent. So I thought, well, looking at the existing leaders, it's too late to try and change and reform them. We need to groom new leaders from scratch. You need to start from the start beginning. Start from the beginning. Because it takes a lifetime to become a good leader. And so I thought, well, why not create uh, a school that will, create, that will develop better leaders for Africa? Uh, and that's really how the vision started. How old were you when it was really, when you know, it became concrete in your mind? How old were you? Uh, I was 26. So still fairly young. Yes. So what were the next steps? So at the time I was doing my Master's of Business Administration, my MBA. Uh, I was studying in the U.S. at Stanford. And uh, so I spent a year writing the business plan and thinking about what the school would do and how it would function. And, uh, and then I put together a small team and uh, raised a little bit of money for my friends and family. Uh, and then we started the project with a small pilot. Um, but then the money ran out after about six months. <laughs> so we went for about another two years without any money uh, and just kept thinking and talking to everyone that we knew about the, our vision. And eventually we got support and uh, four years later we got 1,700 applications from 36 countries in Africa, from young people who wanted to come to this academy to become trained to become these future leaders. I mean and we selected the first 100 out of that. So it started with 100 and from that, from that group. You know, I just want to say, uh, Fred, you make it sound so easy. I know, I know there was a struggle and you do say, you know, we raised some money and then for two years we had no money. But tell us, so how were you surviving for those two years? Well, anyway, I could, you know, so <clears throat> I didn't have a salary. So one thing I did is I made sure that I had meetings with, with people for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. <laughs> for so food. They would, they would buy me lunch because they knew I was a starving entrepreneur. Wow. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I stayed on my friend's couches and in the backyard of my friend's cottage, you know, all these kinds of things which are 
allowed us to suffer. But, but the thing is, I didn't actually, it didn't actually bother me that I didn't have any money because I was pursuing a dream. And that's what kept me motivated and I was so excited about the possibility of changing the future of Africa by developing better leaders. I thought we were solving the biggest problem that Africa has. If we can give Africa better leaders, we can move Africa forward. And so that is what kept me and everyone else who was working on the team going, even when we didn't have any money, when we had all kinds of challenges, we said, this dream is too important to give up. We need to keep going. Do you think there's a problem with uh, many people who have a passion and probably it's more young people who want gratification when it comes to money and wealth too early? Would your advice then be, look, just chase, if you believe in your passion, chase it, go through the hard times and worry about the wealth so I, later. I, I always believe that uh, if you follow your passion mm -hmm. and really, really work very hard at it and not give up, the money will eventually come, no matter what you're doing. So uh, if you look at some of the most wealthy people in the world, what motivated them to, was actually not the wealth that they were trying to create. Or not, it was actually not the wealth that they created. They were chasing something much bigger, a purpose. And it, the money was a byproduct. Was, was just, it just happened to come because they, did, they chased that purpose so well. So I always, my advice to everyone is find what you're passionate about and follow that no matter what and don't give up. And eventually you'll find that the money will come because you'll be so good at it that people will pay you for it. Let's talk a little bit about um, where the academy is today. Well, today we have about 600 young leaders in the program that are under, under development. About 400 of them have graduated and have gone on to universities all around the world. And um, they're already starting to impact uh, communities significantly. For example, in the Kenyan election that happened recently, one of our um, product, one of our, the first, one, one of our young leaders who was actually in that, you know, the first class that we had at the academy. Um, he had been affected by the previous elections, the 2007 elections, and he saw the violence that happened and he realized that a lot of it had been caused by youth who were manipulated by politicians. So he decided that he was going to do something about it for this, this, this time around. And so over the last five years, he's been building a, a youth movement. Um, and um, he managed to mobilize about 350,000 young people in Kenya. And those 350,000 people also reached out to another 5 million young people between the ages of 18 and 35 and got them all to commit to not be manipulated by the politicians during the elections and to all commit to, even though they were from different ethnic groups, that they would not engage in any sort of you know, uh, ethnic violence. And if you consider there were 12 million registered voters in the Kenyan election, and they managed to touch 5 million of them, um, that's impact. Uh, and another one of our young leaders, also from Kenya, launched a project called the I Am Kenyan Project, where she got um, Kenyans of different ethnic backgrounds to take pictures of themselves and post them online. Seen, seen some very lovely that. ones, exactly. yes, so, totally. So she, 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 that, she launched yes. that project. So um, where, what, what really excites me is the impact that our young leaders are already starting to have. It, you know, I thought it would take 10, 20, 30 years for them to start to, to impact Africa. It's already happening now, even though um, you know, some of them are, haven't even graduated from university yet. But the, they've taken the training that we've given them at the academy and they're using it to impact um, the society. So over the last um, six years, we've received um, about 16,000 applications from 48 countries in Africa, and we've selected 600 of them who are now going through uh, training, and we have a, a beautiful campus in South Africa, uh, and um, about 85 staff from all over Africa and all over the world who are working towards making this dream possible. Stay with the Africa Leadership Dialogues. It's, it's fascinating to, to see what you've achieved and the possibilities it opens up for the continent because, you know, it is, it is great minds and think tanks and, and education plays a key role that, that, that has contributed to, to getting the world where it is today. And in many of the big plays globally, we see Africa has never been part of the decision-making process. Uh, but now, uh, where we are today, there seems to be a growth of Pan-Africanism um, increased stability, education uh, certainly improved in many parts of the continent. 
where do you see us heading if, if things continue this way? So I say that it's, this is a very exciting time for Africa. Uh, for the first time in our history, a lot of the conflict and wars have stopped. And Africa, you know, is much more peaceful today. 30, 25, 30 years ago, there were about 33 countries out of 54 that were in some form of conflict or war. Today, that number is only about five. So um, once you have stability and peace, economies can start to grow. And that's what we're seeing in Africa today. Uh, it's the second fastest growing region in the world. There's still a lot of poverty, but we're growing much faster than the rest of the world. There's a global crisis in the US and, and, and Europe, and Africa is actually growing. So um, this I see is Africa's century. And it's the young people who are going to make it so. Because 65% of Africa's population is below the age of 21. The average age of an African is 18.5. So if we can mobilize the energies of these young people and get them to um, think as entrepreneurs and not as people who are going to look for jobs from people, but who are going to create their own jobs, then we're going to get the energy uh, to solve all the problems that we have in Africa. And we're going to create the wealth um, that we need to create in Africa so that we can stop begging the rest of the world for aid and we can feed our own children, pave our own roads, educate our children, build housing for ourselves and we can really be great as a continent. And that's what I believe we have the possibility to do. So today Africa is where China was 30 years ago. We're just starting to take off and we now need to make sure that we don't lose this momentum and we keep building on it and better leadership is what's going to get us there. You deal with a lot of these young, these young African minds. What do you think are the greatest challenges and the greatest opportunity with the young people in Africa today? Well, I'll talk about the opportunities first. I think the greatest opportunity is for them to be growing up in an era when they have all the possibilities to, to become truly successful. Uh, you don't have the wars that were happening 20, 30 years ago that most of them, their parents had to deal with. You don't have uh, the coup d'etats that you had to do. You have technologies today, like mobile uh, technology and internet and everything that is giving them access to all this kind of information that they did, their parents didn't have. And so we are lucky that we can skip the rest of the world in a lot of things. You know? So for example, you know, the innovation that has happened in Kenya with M-Pesa, uh, it's much, much, um, you know, it, it, it's an application of mobile technology that is way, way transforming ahead. Transforming and transforming lives. It's transforming lives, lives mm. but it's much more advanced than what they have in America. Right. You know, because Kenya didn't have the, all these landlines that they had to deal with, they could jump the queue. And so we can jump the queue now because we have, if we want to understand, you know, it took um, some scientists in America, you know, maybe 30 years to understand how to purify water. We don't have to take 30 years. We can go onto the internet and just download the formula. I love it. that. We can jump the queue. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you see that, so we need to think about, um, so that's the greatest opportunity is to, th is to use uh, education and innovation um, and, uh, and, and really jump the queue to, to develop and, and catch up with the rest of the world faster. And that's what these young people have as, a, as the greatest opportunity. And it's okay. going to come through entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. um, which I believe is a, more of a mindset of solving problems and seeing problems, coming up with innovative solutions, solving those. And then in doing that, you're actually going to create a business or some kind of a, another uh, venture which will actually create wealth but also solve the, solve the problems. And that's the greatest opportunity. In terms of challenge, um, the biggest challenge that we face, there's, there's, there's two or three big challenges that we face in Africa today. Um, one is the challenge of uh, urbanization. Over the next 40 years, 800 million Africans are going to move into cities. And so we have to plan for this very, very carefully and make sure we have all the services in the cities and uh, infrastructure, roads, electricity, and so forth to be able to support all these people who are going to move from rural areas to urban areas. Mm -hmm. And that's a big, big challenge that we have to address. Uh, it's also an opportunity, by the way. <laughs> the other uh, challenge is Africa's growing population and the size of the workforce. By 2030, Africa will have a larger workforce than China. And by 2050, Africa will have the largest workforce in the world. There'll be 1.2 billion people that need jobs in Africa. 
And so that these young people who are growing up today are going to have this challenge of creating jobs for all these people. But once again, the opportunity I talked about earlier about entrepreneurship and, and applying knowledge that other from the rest of the world that we can use to jump the queue to develop ourselves. If we do that, we'll be able to create jobs for these 1.2 billion people. In fact, we have no other choice. We have to do this. Fred, let's talk a little bit about our social structures. In many parts of Africa, whether it's rural or urban, we're seeing a, a, a breakdown of family. What is also happening is it seems you have people caught between our cultural, our traditions and our cultural norms and the Western uh, norms. What are your thoughts and observations, especially when it comes to young people in terms of finding ourselves as young Africans? See, I think that traditionally African cultures have, have very much um, underutilized the potential of young people. I remember growing up, my parents and other adults, you know, it, it was very much, um, don't talk to us unless we talk to you. <laughs> and wait until children it's Children are turn. not heard. Children are not, <laughs> yes. they're seen but they're not seen heard. <laughs> and you know, if you come up with an idea or you want to challenge, then you're told, oh, you're being too big for your boots. But the problem is, we can't afford to wait for people to grow up in Africa to solve the problems that we have. I told you about how the average age of an African is 18.5. So we have to encourage our young people um, to challenge adults and to come up with their own ideas and, and, to, and, to, and to reward them for doing that and, and not tell them that they are being too big for their boots. And so I think that um, that's really a, 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 a great need in Africa is to, is, to, is to believe in young people and say that even though you are only 16 or 17, you can do great things and will take you seriously and will take your ideas and suggestions seriously. And, 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 and uh, be, because uh, increasingly, as you mentioned, they don't have that support system of the families to be able to, to look at. They need to be able to learn to look after themselves. And how do we get back to those support systems? Not just of family, but even of extended family, of community. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's really about uh, understanding the great aspects of African culture and heritage. And, 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 and making sure that uh, we teach our young people about, about those values. It's really about values. That, you know, what are the good African values that we have of caring for each other, uh, of uh, sharing what we have with each other, um, and, uh, and respect and so forth. You know? uh, and so making sure that uh, even though we're encouraging these young people to stand up and, and, and take initiative, they mustn't forget these values. Uh, and use that as a way to, uh, because when we develop in Africa, we don't have to uh, forget our own culture. If you go to Japan today, it's a very advanced society. But if they, um, you look at the architecture, it still has a lot of uh, their own Japanese cultural, cultural influence, influence and their designs. And, you know, mm -hmm. if they launch a bullet train, they'll still bring a Shinto priest to bless, bless the, the train, even though it's the, the highest level of technology in the world. Uh, they're still putting their culture in there. So we must make sure that uh, as we develop, we take the best elements of our culture and we put it in our development and not forget it. We talk about the, the, the migration, the urbanization and, and, and it, the numbers. And we do know the struggle we have with employment, but uh, again, innovation and entrepreneurship could be the answer to that. But th th there are many challenges, there, there are huge opportunities, and, and you've highlighted so many of them. So paint a picture for us, Fred. Where do you see your ideal Africa five years from now? Well, I don't think five years down the line. I think 50 years down the line. Do we have to wait that long, <laughs> really? <laughs> Unfortunately. OK, see, 50 years from now. We need to realize that um, development is not a short-term game. Mm -hmm. It takes 50 to 100 years to create a great society. It took China 30 years. What, the, what, the, what you are seeing today in China with all the prosperity, they began it 30 years ago. So too often in Africa, we're trying to find a shortcut. Right. There's no shortcut to development. Mm -hmm. We have to think 30, 50 years down the line. Singapore, that's what they did. You know, they went from being a third world country to being one of the most prosperous countries in the world in 50 years. 
So we have to think that, that horizon. And so in 50 years time, I expect that uh, through innovation, through entrepreneurship, um, through good education and good leadership, most importantly, Africa will be on par with the rest of the world uh, in terms of its uh, wealth and infrastructure. And you know, it will be a continent where the average person growing up can expect to have good health care, good education, a roof over their heads, and enough money to afford all the goods and services that they need to survive. And if we have good leadership and entrepreneurship, we can actually achieve this in the next 50 years. But it's going to take that long. It, that, for me, that's so painful, but you know, <laughs> I'll roll with it <laughs> as long as we get there. I think that is, that is the key thing. And, and, and You'll it, still be alive, that's the good news. I'm not sure, I'm hoping, I'm hoping. At this stage, I'm not sure. Um, please, Fred, look into the camera and uh, give Africans your words of advice, your secrets to success. What message do you have to share with the continent? The message I have to share with Africa today is to realize that this is our time. There's no reason for us not to become a prosperous and wealthy continent. And uh, we have all the knowledge today to solve all the problems that we have. And as long as we, 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 we keep our leaders accountable and, hold our, and, and all think about ourselves as entrepreneurs and not as job seekers, but people who are going to actually create our own jobs, uh, we really are going to be able to make this a great continent. And um, it's a very exciting time to be an African. And let's capture this opportunity. Thank you so much, Fred. Much appreciated. Thank you. <laughs> Stay with the Africa Leadership Dialogues. You're watching the African Leadership Dialogues. My name is Fred Swanika and I'm the founder of the African Leadership Academy in South Africa. Well, they say nothing good comes easy, and this was certainly the case for Fred Swanika. But look at his achievements so far. With the Africa Leadership Academy, we have a generation of young, informed and networked Africans who can make a remarkable change for this continent. It'll be interesting to see the impact that they do have on Africa in the years to come. Well, right now, we go straight to your views. This week we asked, in your view, what are the qualities of a good leader and what can be done to ensure Africa chooses good leaders? Annette Wanyaki says, a good leader ensures that development improves the livelihood of a majority of citizens, one who steers them towards economic empowerment and improvement. Good leadership makes a leader admirable. Jacob Rhodes says, we need to shun negative ethnicity and also encourage the rule of law to take center stage in our leadership practice for us to have the best leaders. Humility is a key quality for a good leader and they should be good listeners too. Moses Kamso says, a good leader should be wise, visionary, assertive, a good communicator, humble and respectful. People need clear sensitization on what leadership means to any society or community. So do away with the prejudicial mentality of my tribe, family, and religious affiliation and do fundamental and objective evaluation on the basis of ideologies and performance track record. And it's time for Africa's Top 10. This week on Africa's Top 10, we feature rugby nations in Africa according to the International Rugby Board as of July 15th, 2013. Starting our countdown at number 10 is Uganda. They are ranked at position 51 globally with 46.36 points. Senegal takes the number 9 slot with 46.89 points. They are ranked at position 47 globally. Coming in at number 8 is Madagascar. They are ranked at position 41 globally with 48.04 points. Tunisia takes the number 7 slot. They are ranked at position 42 with 48.25 points. The Ivory Coast comes in at number 6. They are ranked at position 40 globally with 49.13 points. At number 5 we have Morocco. They are ranked at position 37 globally with 50.88 points. Zimbabwe takes the number 4 spot. 
They are ranked at position 32 globally with 52.63 points. Kenya stands at number 3 on the continent and are ranked at position 31 globally with 52.78 points. Namibia comes in at number 2. They are ranked at position 23 globally with 58.7 points. And ranking at number 1 is South Africa. They stand at number 2 globally with an impressive 87.03 points. That's Africa's top 10 this week. Well, we've already come to the close of the show and we end this week with a quote from African-American civil rights activist Martin Luther King Jr. He said, Intelligence plus character, that is the goal of true education. I look forward to seeing you again next week. Blessings to you and blessings to Africa.